But I looked around and I realized I'm successful at something I don't care for. Why am I convinced I'm not going to be successful at these things I do care for? Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy you're here. And thank you to everybody that has reached out and told me about the jobs you quit or the jumps you're trying to take. I love hearing from you. If you want to reach out to me, the best place is probably Instagram at lessons from a quitter, or you can always shoot me an email or DM me on other platforms. I usually respond, but I will respond the fastest on Instagram. So go ahead and find me. Let me know what you're up to. And if there's anything I can do to help, I am so excited about the show today. I think this is our first comedian. Drew Morgan is a stand-up comic writer, and actor. You likely know him as one-third of the trio that calls themselves the liberal rednecks. His comedy and writing partners are Trey Crowder and Corey Forrester. Trey Crowder received some notoriety from his viral videos where he takes on certain political happenings in the South and all over the country, and he kind of adds his Southern flair to them. They have been touring the country on their well-read comedy tour, and they wrote a book called The Liberal Redneck Manifesto. But what a lot of people don't know is that before Drew Morgan became a comedian, he was actually a lawyer. So we got to talk to him today about how his upbringing in rural Tennessee affected his decision to go to law school, how law school at Boston College law school was for him and his experience as a public defender in both Miami and Tennessee, and ultimately what led him to move to New York and pursue stand-up comedy uh, and what the last couple of years have been like because they've gained a lot of success and what that ride has been like and what they're up to now. I think he provides a lot of great insight into taking that jump and, and doing something you love, even if it is a really hard career like stand-up comedy is. I'm super excited to talk to him. So let's jump right in. Hi, Drew. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited um, to get into what you're doing now and, and all the fun stuff. But we usually start back from the beginning. So I don't usually go too far back into how people grew up. But I think that because of what you're doing now is so relevant to like where you came from. Why don't you let us know kind of where you grew up and how your journey kind of led you to law school? Sure. Uh, I'm from a town in East Tennessee uh, on the outskirts of Appalachia <laughs> uh, in Morgan County called Sunbright. Um, we named it after the sun. That's what I always, <laughs> our first mayor was a caveman. Sunbright, infrastructure bath. Uh, it's tiny, uh, not a lot of jobs or anything like that. It's sort of, if you follow the news these days, it's kind of the uh, sort of typical rural area where the jobs and the uh, according to the press, all the smart people are leaving. And it, it was just it was just a tiny town. My dad worked for the railroad, which meant he was away a lot. Like that was a good job, but he had to travel for it. And my mom uh, was eventually a teacher. She didn't get through with school until I was 14. And law school specifically was just a product of me being one of those smart kids. And, you know, it's interesting. I remember I've, I've told a few people about this. I remember when I was in high school, Teachers definitely talking to me about my future, you know, which they should, and talking to me about the fact that I'm smart and all that and how I, but the idea of me ending up there, it, it, it's not like they said, don't end up here. They just didn't talk about me being there. Mm. They were like, you should go to medical school and law school. And I guess those are jobs, obviously, you could eventually come back, but there was no, you'll be a pillar in the community. There was one coach who would be like, I'll work for you one day. Uh, but for the most part, it was like, subtextually, it was like, get the fuck out of right, here. Right, right. And law school was just me continuing school. I think I was in retrospect. I didn't know this at the time. I was just hiding. I got done with undergrad. I had good grades. I had a lot of advisors there. I went to Maryville College, which is a tiny liberal arts school outside of Knoxville. 
And they were like, you, you should go to grad school if you're interested in it. You'd be good at it. They weren't pushing me necessarily, but they were just like, yeah, you'd be good at it. And I guess my whole life, I'm real argumentative and contrarian. <laughs> so like anyone who's like that, you should be a lawyer, you know? So I was like, all right, I guess I should. And what I've told people about comedy and law is like, being a comedian was so alien. I didn't know a lawyer growing up. Like every lawyer was one town over where the county seat is. So like my parents didn't have friends who were lawyers, much less know anyone who was a comedian. So it just wasn't part of my world. I mean, my town had 600 people in it. So law school was me reaching for the stars to a certain extent. And also just like, this is what you do. You're mm-hmm. a smart guy. You keep going to school, you get a good job, and and you like to argue. You'll be good at that. Right. Obviously, we all have our own different influences and different unique things. But I do think that's kind of a, a typical story where you're smart and you're good in school. And so you get funneled into one of these safe careers. And it's like, oh, you're good at arguing. So why not law school without really thinking about it? And so I hear that a lot with a lot of the guests. You, you just don't know what else to do. So you're just going like one step to the next since like college. And then now that college is over, like, what about grad school? Sure. You know? Well, and for me, I think something that's added that all that's true. And then on top of that was it was a big deal. It was right. a big deal for my family mm-hmm. for me to go to law school. It mm-hmm. was a big deal for my community. But those teachers I was talking about right. uh, in high school, you know, it was like Boston College Law School. I might as well have gotten into Yale to them. Yeah. And that was me at 19 when I was thinking about law school. I think by the time I was actually going to law school, which was a year, I, I took a year off in between undergrad and law school and went to Australia. I think at that point it was like, yeah, I don't have any better ideas and why not? Mm -hmm. I was very ignorant about, you know, loans, Mm -hmm. (laughs) how much money I was going to make. The market was way better when I started. I'm 07 to 010. That is literally the worst three years (laughs) in terms of the difference between when you went to law school and the economy versus when you got out in the economy. Uh, So yeah. So it was all the things you said. And then also, I think by the time I actually was going to go to law school, it was like, yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, and I I know that's a flip of attitude, but it was like, for me, I had already exceeded a lot of uh, expectations, I think, in terms of where I came from. But then also I was just like, yeah, sure, I'll do Mm -hmm. this. If it doesn't work out, I'll be making money. I'll pay my loans off and I'll teach or something. Yeah. I imagine that with that also comes a certain level of pressure, you know, where, where you are like seen as making it. And there's this pressure from your family or community where it's like you're carrying this torch and you're, you're going out and you're doing these incredible things. And so did you feel kind of like that you, you wanted to do it for them or to, you know, to pay it back? For my parents, specifically my mother, who was a teacher. And then my dad, who, I mean, he was a laborer and I've done a little bit of that in the summers and stuff like that. Yeah. There was some pressure there consciously and then subconsciously. And it became conscious as I became a public defender and we can get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then it became, kind of taking them with me sort of thing. Yeah. And to be to be fair, I've kept that even in comedy. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that. So you go to law school and when you're in law school, was there a time where you kind of realized like this isn't for me or I shouldn't be here? Or was it kind of like yes. pushed through? Oh, there was. Okay. Almost immediately. Um, and I was a coward, uh, which might be too harsh of a word, but I was... Uh, you know, I went to Australia, hung out with my friends. I came back. I'm going to law school. I'm bad at it at first. And I blamed laziness. And I was like, you know, you went to Australia. You forgot how to be a student. You're not reading your subjects. And I wasn't. But Mm -hmm. in retrospect, I hated them. And there was a part of me after that first semester that was like, maybe I need to get out. But I was already like 30K in the hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, No, it'll be fine because this, you know, we're doing all these survey courses and like, this isn't being a lawyer. By the way, still had no idea what it was (laughs) to be a lawyer. I was correct. 1L has nothing to do with being a lawyer, but it turns out being a lawyer was just as bad for me. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, again, I think that this is something that happens a lot. And once you're in it and you're already in debt and uh, you went in it not knowing like most of us. And then so you're kind of like, well, I just got to keep pushing through and and it'll be better later. But that unfortunately yeah. is not true. Well, and one thing that happened too, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this, when you're really what you're talking about is either a class or a cultural change or both. No one that I would be comfortable talking to would know how to advise me on that. You know, my, my right. parents are very smart, but like those kinds of problems 
those were just those are the problems they wanted me to have. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I wasn't the type of guy at the time to seek out mentors. And part of that was just I had that chip on my shoulder. I had come from where I had come from. And like, you know, I'm not asking anybody for help kind of thing. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so you go through law school and you end up becoming a public defender. And now you've mentioned a little bit that had something to do with where you came from, too. Was that like a plan that you wanted to be a public defender? Or was that like once you graduated, that was the job that was there? No, it wasn't a plan, but it wasn't also just once I graduated. It happened in law school. And what I was saying about where I came from, it was more of like my father's a preacher as Mm -hmm. well as a laborer. My mother's a teacher. It was sort of like, oh, I I feel like I should be using this newfound power. You know, some of the law professors would give speeches, you know, about we're all privileged now, no matter where you came from. And you you have all this power with this knowledge. And that was true. It really affected me. Like I kind of bought into that a little bit. And I think that was because of where I came from. The first thing I tried to do was get into immigration law. I couldn't do it. We didn't, you don't have any tools, Mm -hmm. you know, bless the hearts of everyone doing that kind of work right now. You you have no, the constitution, you don't even get it. It's, it's like, doesn't apply to your clients. So all that frustrated me. And then I thought, well, all right, well, I'll try to be a public defender. And what attracted me to it was two things. One was the idea that I'd be a trial lawyer, which I really, school was really getting me down. And I felt like, well, that might be a place that I can, you know, be comfortable for the rest of my life. Two, I couldn't see myself being a prosecutor. At the time, I entertained it way more than I would now. But at the time, I knew myself enough to know, you know, look, I get that we need men and women to stand up and say this person's bad, but I can't be that person. And that probably also has a little bit to do with where I come from. And then three, I had a lot of friends in law school. I was attracted to the to the do-gooders, to the people who are bleeding hearts. I mean, those are my people. I'm one yeah. of them. But they all had these causes, and I didn't have one of those. And I thought, well, with public defense, I don't need one. I have people. Right. You know, I have a client. I don't need a cause. I have a human. Mm-hmm. And that that really felt concrete to me. And it was. If my personality and brain were more suited to it, I'd still be being a public yeah. defender. Like, everything I just said is true, and it meant a lot to me. It's funny because I felt I was a I worked as a federal public defender for many years and I feel like everything you're saying I could 100 percent relate to. And I think that if you have that inkling to help people in in certain situations, the law was a little more forgiving and and the justice system wasn't as awful as it is. uh, I would probably still be doing it as well. But so you did it in Miami. And what was your experience like as a public defender? I mean, it was fun. It was difficult, but it was a lot of fun. Miami's an interesting office. Uh, (laughs) I was at the juvenile public defender's office down there in Miami Dade. And, you know, the fact that it was kids was interesting. That, that's something that I never imagined doing. Yeah. It's just where they start you because the stakes are much lower because right. there's very little jail time. Right. But to me, I re- like the stakes were higher. I was going to say, would that be even more depressing? Because it's like you see them entering the system at such a young age and you kind of realize what that future is going to be. Sometimes it's more depressing. It's certainly lower lows. But, but what I realized, and this is probably why they did it, other than the fact that, you know, if you screw up royally, you can still, you know, someone can still kind of save it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the other reason I realized is there's some hope there. When I moved into the adult division and then when I moved to Knoxville, you know, you do see the same people over and over right. again. In the juvenile division, sometimes that first time was enough for a kid. Right. I can see that. So, so you go from Miami and you become a public defender in Knoxville? Yeah, uh, I moved from Miami to Knoxville. Miami and Knoxville, they're the the two public defenders have a good relationship. The actual public defenders have a good relationship. They have worked together in terms of like national training and stuff like that for years. So I had that in, and then it's near where I'm from, and my brother got in trouble with the law, and I wanted to be close to my family during that, and it just made sense. And my soon-to-be boss thought very highly of Miami-Dade, so yeah, moved me right yeah. in there. And how long did you work in that public defender office? Uh, it was about a year for both. I think one was just at a year and the other one was a little longer. And I think Knoxville was the one that was closer to a year and a half. Okay. And then so after you do your year and a half in Knoxville, I know eventually you moved to New York. Now, did you move wanting to do public defense or like when was the time that you kind of decided that you were done with law or with public defense? Now, that was a slow burn for me. I was a public defender in Knoxville. I was getting good at it for my age. You know, I was figuring it out. I was uh, good in the sort of culture of court. 
my biggest problem was the was the work work. And when I by work work, I'm I'm sure every lawyer considers one part or the other harder than the other. For me, it was research, it was writing, it was managing the number of cases, it was remembering what's on the docket this morning. You know, and I know for some of my colleagues, you know, it was like they couldn't get their clients to trust them. Clients loved me. Right. You know, th- I, that part was good. I was pretty good in court. I'm quick on my feet, which helps me in comedy. But just the actual paperwork of it, which it was law school. I mean, right. it's what it reminded me of. The other thing that was happening, though, is all the stuff that was going on with my brother was really starting to have an effect on me. I started to sort of see him and all the clients, and I couldn't separate that. And emotionally, it was getting to me. I was gaining weight. I was becoming depressed and anxious. I was drinking a lot. I mean, which it's funny. <laughs> You talk to lawyers a lot. I would say this is a somewhat typical story. And even if it's not on your podcast, I know it's a typical story in the law. I thought that story was so typical that you could. But you tell that to, I don't know, a nurse or whatever. (laughs) Well, that might be a bad example because I see death so much. But you know what I'm saying? You tell that and your buddies are like, you're miserable. Yeah. And I'm like, nah, man, (laughs) you know, it's tough because that's the other thing we do in public defense culture. It's like, you know, it is fucking hard. It's like a gallows humor we're in this kind of thing. And, um, I started to realize emotionally, I didn't know if I could do it. And then I also started to fall in love with comedy. It's funny because in law, when you're in it, it's, it's amazing how accepted it is that everyone's just miserable. Like you don't even bat an eye. There's all these jokes about like drinking and kind of numbing that pain. And and it's funny when you look at like the requirements to do these continuing education for suicide and drinking and wh- whatever else it is. And you start realizing like when you're out of it, how insane that is that we have higher suicide rates and depression rates and all this stuff. Yet people find it very difficult to walk away. You know, it's like you continue that and you end up with substance abuse problems or alcohol problems. And so the fact that you saw that that was happening and, and decided to make a change is, I think, obviously much wiser and more insight than a lot of other people have. But yeah, it, it's unfortunately a very big problem in the professions. Well, the other thing about that, I mean, it is a huge problem, and I have a lot of thoughts as to why, and, you know, people can obviously feel free to disagree. I mean, I think it attracts us a little bit, you know, and that's not to say it's the only profession that attracts people who are prone to depression or alcoholism. That's not what I mean, but I do think, you know, if you, especially if you want to be a trial lawyer, there's obviously some ego involved. We're combative, and then it is hard. It's stressful. It's really stressful. The other thing with me, I don't want to take too much credit in terms of wisdom. I think what was going on with me, and I do a pretty good job with this, I think. It wasn't that I was smart enough to realize this is killing me as much as I was becoming a bad lawyer because of it. And my heart and my ego could not handle that. There was a part of me that was like, Drew, you you shouldn't be here mm. if you're not completely here. These people deserve better. Yeah. And I never let it got to where I was doing bad work. But it was coming, and I knew that. And by giving myself the out of saying, like, this is going to end soon, it helped me to do good work till it was over. That's still, I think, insightful. I think a lot of people may not see that. And I appreciate that you were able to uh, put your clients first in that. So how did you get involved in comedy? Uh, Well, I love comedy. I always have. And uh, I kind of always wanted to do stand-up. But I just, like I said, I mean, it's almost like being a lawyer was so alien to where I grew up being a comedian. I mean, you might as well have been from a different planet. (laughs) Then when I was in cities where I got the opportunity, I think it was fear and all the things anyone who's thinking about doing a performance would go through. I just now started to entertain the possibility at, you know, 25 or whatever. So I had to go through all that, that most people might've gone through at 18. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's an actor and she's pretty in tune with me and she knew that I love stand-up. I mean, I would watch stand-up instead of listen to music. It's kind of my thing. One day, we were in Miami at the time, and she was like, hey, there's this competition. You know, you're always making me listen to your damn jokes. So why don't you go do it? And I was like, yeah, maybe I will. We remember the story differently. She's <laughs> like, uh, she remembers that then I went and did it. I remember that her response was, well, I signed you up, and I told all your friends. <laughs> like, knowing that I wouldn't back down. Oh. Uh, I went, and I did that competition. I came in second. And uh, I sort of feel like that's where it all started, but where it all started. I don't know. I've, I often joke that like coming in second, there, there's some sort of <laughs> metaphor there. I think that most people that have never done that 
and I know that maybe being a trial lawyer helped you kind of with that fear of being in front of people, but never done stand up comedy and getting in front of in, in a competition. I mean, did you have doubts of like, I've never done this. I don't know how to get up and tell jokes in front of people. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, doing well in that was probably not necessarily great for me in terms of my comedy <laughs> career. Oh. Because when the failure started, because it always does, right. it was like perhaps a bigger problem. Oh. Does like, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like and it, I don't I, there's no way for me to know. Maybe I would have gone through the same sort of psychological right. what am I doing? This is bad kind of thing anyway no matter when the failure came, but there's a part of me that's like, well, if it came first, I don't know, that whole thing might have been different. Maybe not. Maybe I would have quit immediately. Right, right. I mean, that's a great leeway because I'm wondering, like, was there a time when you were doing this where, you know, I'm sure every comic has to go through the not doing well in front of people or getting heckled or whatnot. So was there a time when, you know, it's not going well where you're thinking like, why did I leave to do this? Or why am I doing this notoriously very difficult job? No. Mm. Partially because it wasn't like an immediate thing. Comedy was very much a hobby, and I was still a public defender for almost two years. When I moved back to Knoxville, you know, you got to remember I had all that personal stuff going on. And that was really hard for me. And without getting too much into it, I mean, it was really having an effect on every aspect of my life, including whether or not I could be a public defender. And comedy was just sort of a release from that. And when I moved to New York, I gave myself the excuse. My wife wants to move to New York. You know, she followed me to Miami when we first got married. Uh, She followed me back home to help me when I was helping my family out. But she's an actor. She wants to go to New York. I'm going to go to New York. And, you know, I can do law there. I got a good resume and I can be a Harlem defender, maybe even get on at the Brooklyn defenders. And that's, you know, that's one of the top ones. I was telling myself all that stuff. So the question of whether or not there was ever I decided to quit public defense And comedy was my hope to do that next. But if comedy failed, there was never really a part of me that was like, "I'm and I'll go back to public defense. It it helped that I had the degree and the skills where I could say, oh, I can support myself. But, well, I mean, to put it this way, I did doc review in New York. And that, to me, it was like, that was quitting public defense right Mm -hmm. there, more Mm -hmm. than starting stand-up. Like, there was never a fear in my mind of like, if man, what if stand-up doesn't work out? I'll have to go back. It was like, if stand-up doesn't work out, I'll figure something. Maybe I'll teach. I'll figure something out. But that wasn't for me. Right. And so for the non-lawyers listening, doc review is basically like when you review very like large amounts of documents. And um, so were you doing that as like a freelancer, like a law firms were paying you to do document review for them? Yeah, and to to keep it going for the non-lawyer listeners and anyone who's never done it, even as a lawyer, you you know, you know what it is. But the culture is, I mean, it's it can be high hours. You get paid pretty well by the hour, but you just sit there all day, you (laughs) stare at a computer screen. There's like quite a few people like me who were like hustling, trying to do something on the side. I remember there was one guy who was an agent. He said he wanted to rep me, but he mostly did musicians. So I said no. There were singers, there were writers. But unfortunately, there were also people who had got washed up in the economic downturn, people whose own solo practices had kind of taken a hit or gone under. And so those are people who are at a very stressed out time in their life. And they very, very much want to be, quote unquote, real lawyers. And in their minds, they're not. So you're sharing this tiny cubicle space. That's the other thing. You're in like a warehouse looking situation usually. And so I'm saying all that to say, me choosing to do that so I could pursue comedy at night, sure. But also instead of being a public defender, like the writing was on the wall for me in terms of that. And I guess that leads to my next question, though. It seems like your wife was really supportive. But, you know, we talked about like your parents and and the pride they had for you being a lawyer. So when you kind of started transitioning into this comedy, did you get any pushback from like friends or family? No. Well, maybe friends who were just sort of like, and maybe I was doing this on purpose so as not to get pushed back. I don't think I was painting it to people as I'm quitting the law to be a comedian. It was more of like, I'm going to New York. I have a job technically as a lawyer that is allowing me to pursue this thing a lot heavier than maybe people realize I'm pursuing it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there was no, I don't, I don't remember making an announcement. I mean, I did talk <laughs> to my parents. I did talk to my parents about yeah. it for sure. And for them, again, 
you know, I don't want to get caught up in an emotional thing. And I realize this is a very unique situation. I, I used to make jokes about it and this is a very dark joke, but it's like, you know, you got one son going to prison. The other <laughs> one's kind of allowed to do whatever he wants. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yes, they were, I think they were scared for me more than anything because being a lawyer was completely alien to them, but they knew that it paid well or that it was, you know, safe. Right. I think they were mostly scared for me. Mm. But I also think that my mother, who pushed me to study abroad, who pushed me to live in Australia, who pushed me to do well in school, was like, well, you know, I've done this. I've kind of told him there's a big world out there. Don't feel limited because you're from where you're from. And I think they were proud of me for the most part. You know, I could totally imagine a scenario where if that lasted a decade and I wasn't making it and it wasn't happening and I was still kind of barely have an insurance, the worst kind and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Yeah, I could totally see it. But luckily for me, it started being successful after about three or four years. Yeah, yeah, which it's incredible. And I want to talk about that now. Like you, for, for people that may not know, you are a part of this well-read comedy tour with Trey Croder and Corey Forster. And and you guys started gaining popularity a couple of years ago when um, I think it was right around like 2016 and whatnot. And, and a lot of your comedy is based on being liberals from like small Southern cities and states and and having pride in like your Southern upbringing, but also not being kind of the stereotypical Southern Republican conservative person. And so you guys have been really taken off in the last, would you say like two years? Uh, I'd say it's probably closer to three at this point because we've been on the road a little over two. Yeah. And how, how has that been? Like, how do you know, like Trey and Corey and how did you guys like create this comedy tour? Yeah, it's been crazy. So like anything in entertainment, it was that sort of overnight success that was seven or eight years in the making. Right. Uh, when I first moved back to Knoxville, I'd been doing comedy sporadically in Miami, but Knoxville actually had, at that time, it still has a pretty good scene. At that time, it had a really good scene for a city this size. There was a lot of open mics. At that time, there was a professional club here called Side Splitters. It was a fucking nightmare, <laughs> but uh, I didn't know any better. I thought this is how comedy clubs work. But... Uh, I came back here. There was a lot of open mics. I met Trey at one of those open mics. Uh, there was a guy. Uh, he's still a friend of ours. He went by the moniker Waylon Whiskey. <laughs> he wanted to start basically like a group to just like hang out and try to get shows and support each other. And so we did that. We were part of it. That's where I met Corey. Corey was a Chattanooga comic who had been doing it at that time probably six years. Trey and I were a year in. This was about eight years ago. We just did bar shows together. We were touring around town. We started writing sketches together, et cetera, et cetera. At some point, I left for New York. We don't have kids. We take off. I look Trey Crowder in his eyes and I say, you're the funniest guy I know. You're never going to make it from here. (laughs) Boy, was I wrong. Um, I went up there. It was going pretty well for me individually. They were doing their own things individually. Corey was doing better as like sort of a regional act. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he was touring in the South. Trey went out to L.A., Uh, And he got on a few shows through some friends we had met through comedy festivals. And if there's any comedians listening right now, comedy festivals, you know, they can be bullshit. They take $25 from you and you don't know if anybody's going to actually be there and blah, blah, blah. But it is a great place to network. And I mean network in a real way. Not like, hey, I'm Drew and I'm Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. I mean, you go, you do stand up. Someone is like, that guy's funny or that girl's funny. I want to work with them. And then they do. They start giving you work. And then, you know, that kind of thing was happening for all of us. Someone Trey met at one of these, got him on a show out there in L.A. And this uh, this woman who's still our manager, her name's Nat Goldberg, she was there in the audience. And my friend DJ, who I mentioned, she walked up the train and goes, do you know who DJ Lewis is? And he was like, do I? <laughs> DJ had already been out there before. They hit it off. She signed him. Around that same time, she, she gets to know us. So this lady is like interested in all of us now. Yeah. And she signs us us all basically as a writing team. Oh, so we're super pumped. But, you know, she's a young manager and I'm not, you know, we were all hustling. I'm not shitting on her. But like, you know, she she had just started out. Right. too. Nothing was anything. But we're like, all right, we're going to stick to this writing team. She actually she got me an audition for this MTV show called Greatest Party Story. I booked it. It paid like one hundred dollars. But, like, in my mind, this validates everything, right. right? It's not about the fact that I'm getting paid. It's about the fact that I I am good at this. This is going to work out. I'm still not able to quit my job. I still got to go back there the next day and right. read a million documents. But 
this pursuit is not insane. Literally four days later, as I remember it, maybe five, because the joke was always traders couldn't handle me doing anything. <laughs> he made the first video right. that he made as the liberal redneck. Mm-hmm. The first video was about Tennessee and making Bible, the Bible, its state book. Ended up not doing it. It did pretty well. Got like 70,000 views, which we were like, kind of like the MTV thing. It was like, well, that doesn't change anyone's life. But yeah, man, we know what yeah, we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And then he made the second one. And if anybody out there knows who Trey Crowder is, this is the reason why, even if it's not the first thing that you saw of his, he made a video about how North Carolina was making those bathroom bills to, to try and keep trans people right. going to the what they deemed the correct bathroom. And he just broke it down in a way and it took off. I think it got 22 million views oh, eventually. Incredible. Yeah, that's how I, I the first time I saw him. And, and so if people don't know who Trey Crowder is and you should Google it and watch these videos because they're hilarious. It's just basically these Facebook videos of him kind of going off. He calls it like the liberal redneck, but it's just like him going off on something that's happening in the South or in America. And from a liberal standpoint, kind of like a breaking it down and they're hilarious. And, and he did all of a sudden kind of like, like you were saying, like overnight success that he'd been working on for like 10 years. Right. So there's a tension. There's what they call heat or whatever now. But I mean, it's still, it's sort of like this amorphous. I mean, who are these? Because people take off on the internet. Remember the uh, Chewbacca mom? Right, right. <laughs> I think a lot of people didn't know what to think of Trey. Rightfully so. Right. Uh, because to most people, he came out of nowhere. But because we had a manager who'd worked in stand up, because we had an act, we'd all been doing it for at least eight. Corey had been doing it, or I mean, so for at least six. I think Corey had been doing it 12. We had an act. Mm-hmm. So we reach out to places and we took a week off from work is what we did. And we planned this tour in May of 2016. So it's mm-hmm. been two and a half years since the tour started. We had Atlanta, I want to say Oxford, I don't even remember. Mm-hmm. We're just doing this little southern thing. We're doing like Mondays at clubs. You know, no one's given us a weekend yet. And we take this week off. We're going to do this little mini tour. We're going to see how it goes. Yeah. And uh, we did two shows in Atlanta at the Punchline. Punchline's a great club. Uh, Corey is the only one of us who had ever even worked there. And we get there, and it's not just sold out. It's like people are clamoring. Like, they're so excited to see Trey. Now, at this time, very few of them knew who Corey and I were. Right. Which, in retrospect, was a blessing because their expectations were so low, even to a certain extent of Trey. They didn't really know if he was a stand-up comic. They just thought he was awesome. So they were like, we'll go see. You know what I mean? So the fact that we had jokes, it it worked out. We sold out two shows. We did really well. We were like, man, maybe we can sell enough tickets to tour. But you still got to figure, Trey's got two kids. Mm. He's got a really good job. Like Mm. a really good job. Trey worked for the government. (laughs) I am living in New York, which is expensive. I'm working my ass off up there doing all this stuff. And uh, it's like, all right, so what do we do? Do we tour on weekends? Maybe we take a month off at some point right. trying to figure that out. But for Corey, I mean, I think Corey was painting cups at at a fucking, what are those cups? White women love them. Uh, <laughs> it's a brand name. And they keep everything cold for like, oh, you know, yeah, till yeah. Jesus comes back. <laughs> Like hydro flasks or like the swell, bo- the there's a bunch All of them. Those that, are yeah. those, you're getting in there, but kind of make it more redneck. And you'll get to because ours is like big and it fits like 44 ounces of soda in it. But yes, that. <laughs> so he didn't. I mean, it's not that he didn't care, but like Corey's thing was like, I'm going to be a comedian. It's all I can do. Right. It, you know what level of success is whatever. For me and Trey, we were in two different places. Trey was where I was, and I was sort of in between him and Corey, which mm. I think is interesting. I had already started pursuing stand-up as full-time as I could. But mm-hmm. because of my bills and where I lived, I mean, that still meant 45 to 60 hours a week, depending on the project, of document review in New York. Oh. And then going to open mics and grinding myself to death. Mm-hmm. And that was getting to me. Yeah. And then Trey has two kids. He had a good job. Mm-hmm. He worked for the federal government. Mm-hmm. So for him to quit that with those kids, and especially... He really needed something. Yeah. So we were selling out these shows, but it was like, yeah, but how much money is that really going to be? And we yeah. and we were trying to figure it out because it, it might be enough. Right. And then our manager, uh, who's just been kick ass, she's trying to find different ways for us to make money. She said, let's do a book. And the first idea was to just do like a coffee table book, like pictures of like church signs in the South. And then we write a funny essay about them. But 
when we started trying to shop for agents, this uh, this woman, uh, Amy, ooh, I'm so bad with last names. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, Amy was like, yeah, we could do that. I'll get you guys a little bit of money. But why don't you guys do like a manifesto? She pitched it as the New South. She pitched it as sort of these guys being the comedic voice of what might be sort of a political revolution. And we weren't that. And we're still not. We do do politics. We don't shy away from it. But anybody who thinks we're heroes, you know, they're just unfortunately, they're incorrect. We're not. We're just guys who make jokes. But we allowed her to sell that to them. And, you know, I'm not going to say the number, but when they came <laughs> back, I was at work. I, I stepped out in the hallway. I fell no. <laughs> into the floor. We got off the phone. I liked that boss a lot on that project, actually, so much that I when I went to talk to him, I said, I'll stay to the end of this week if you want me to, mm-hmm. because I like you. And he was like, are you shitting me? <laughs> Leave right now. That's and I was amazing. like, you're right. I'm leaving right fucking now. Uh, so I did. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. It's still one of the, like, sometimes I get it frustrated with where we're at now. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. And I'm passionate about these things. So I get frustrated. And then I'm like, man, I kind of already won. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I think that you're in a notoriously very difficult industry. And so unfortunately, it's not a predictable thing. And, and like past successes don't really dictate future successes. It's kind of like it's you have to constantly be doing it. And I think especially stand up comedy is such a grind. It's like constant touring and stuff. So I can imagine that even if there's like a high for a while, then when it maybe it settles down or it's not as much, then that's hard to kind of prepare for. It's super hard to prepare for. You got to steal yourself for it, though, because, yeah. you know, this industry that I'm in now is so notoriously. I mean, rejection is just a big part of it. Yeah. But the other thing that I, you got to do, and this was harder for me, is to is to just you got to stay even. So even on the highs, like yeah. that first high, that was great. And then we went on tour and we were selling out. And, buddy, for six months, I gained 20 pounds in six <laughs> months. We were drinking. Every city was new. Everybody wanted to get their picture made with us, right. which I'm an introvert. Eventually, that became very exhausting. But at first, it was like, this is great. Right, right. The book did pretty well. Not as well as the publisher wanted. Uh, <laughs> We went on The View, which that, you know, you talk about your family and and your friends, friends who have been like, okay, you're going to be a comedian now. They're like, oh, fuck, man. (laughs) You know, that's Whoopi Goldberg. (laughs) And we just shot two sketches that I wrote, which I'm really proud of with, you know, I'm not supposed to say this is it's just the digital (laughs) version of people who do comedy and they're centrally located. If that helps anybody. (laughs) And then we have a we have a bigger project that should be announced soon. And and that was a big deal for all all of us and people ask you know did you guys really plan this well not exactly this way but but the honest answer is yes yeah we were there and we would talk about musicians that you know i don't know if you or your fans are familiar with them but people like sturgill simpson or jason isbel uh the drive-by truckers or even margo price now to a certain extent who we saw as southern and southern culture and southern artists and southern entertainment but outside of the typical lane. And so, yeah, we did plan this. And looking at how much success people like Sergio Simpson were starting to have, who is a country music guy, but not the Larry the Cable Guy version of country music, but it's country music. Right. And we were sort of looking at that going, we can be the comedy version Mm -hmm. of that Mm -hmm. in some way. Now, I don't think we knew it would be politics at the time. Yeah. So, no, it didn't go exactly how we planned yeah. it, but it was what we planned. Yeah, but I think that that is actually, again, a common theme that comes up when people make these jumps is, I mean, if you're waiting to kind of figure out exactly what the path is going to be, then you'll wait forever. It'll never get there. And so you have to start taking action and it may not be exactly what you planned it. But like, if you didn't do it, then none of this would happen. You know, like if you didn't make that video. And so you can never know what it's going to be, but it's just a matter of like, aiming for something and doing it and seeing where it goes and kind of taking the next step and the next step. Right. This is probably specific to entertainment, though it might be be broader than that. You never know what's going to get you in the door. What you need to be prepared for is when you do. Yes. So if you're going to make some big jump, get prepared for it. Believe the opportunity will come because if you believe the opportunity will come, you will get prepared for it. I would not have gone to open mics after 10 hour days of doc review. And sometimes I didn't go to open mics, but on the days I did go, there's no way I would have gone if I didn't think 
that something would come of it right. and or if I didn't love comedy. And that's, you know, no matter what you're, if you know, if you're thinking about changing careers, it doesn't have to be in entertainment. Just get prepared and do it. And the other thing that I'll say, and I, and I, I said this to Trey, and he has said that it had an effect on him. And I, I don't remember who I heard say it. I didn't come up with this. But I looked around and I realized I'm successful at something I don't care for. Why am I convinced I'm not going to be successful at these things I do care for? I love that. I literally want to scream. I love that. I mean, it's that is so applicable to like every person I think that listens to this is that we had Isaac Litsky on the show and he, he says like your fear replaces the uncertain with the awful. And I feel like that's what we do. It's a lot of times like you can be successful at something and it's you know, and so you stick with it because you know it, even if you hate it. But because you, it's what you don't know that you always think is going to be like the worst case scenario and you're going to fail and it's going to be a disaster. But what you're saying, I mean, that is the truth. Like, you know, why not you? Like, why not you as a, com- a stand-up comedy? You know, it's, it's always like our brain goes to like, why me? Oh, I'm not going to be good enough. And I love what you just said. Well, and the other thing too, and this is very specific to me and what I did, but if I hadn't made it, if Trey didn't make those videos and I had, you know, I would have gotten some success as a stand up. But the other thing about stand up comedy, I mean, it's all it's all famine and, and fortune. There's almost right. no middle class in, in that. But moving to New York, meeting the people that I met, doing that at twenty eight, I think mm-hmm. is when I got there, twenty nine. You know, it's easy for me to say. But had I quit being a lawyer, done all that, it didn't work out. And I had to go back to being a lawyer or became a teacher or whatever other thing or was a stand-up comic, but just barely made any money mm-hmm. the rest of my life and had to do. It still was the right move. Right. It still was 100 percent the right move. And I know when there's kids, it's like different. I know that. Well, what I know is that I don't know. That's what I'll say. Right. What I know is that I don't know because I don't have them. But man, other than that, I mean, I think it was Bill Burr. He said something like. Yeah, you might live on a cot when you're 32. That's so much better than waking up in a nice, expensive bed that you have to go to work to pay for next to a person who you're not really sure if you know or not because you don't know yourself. Mm. And like that might be a little dramatic, but I just think that's true. No, I mean, that's the whole point of this podcast. And I don't want in any way to like give off that it's easy and you make this jump and everything is going to be great and you're going to make tons of money. And I don't think that's the truth, but I still think it's worth making the jump if you're not happy. I mean, it's figuring it out and maybe it'll be harder, but it's still better than being somewhere where you hate your life. Well, the secret is it's not harder. It's a different kind of hard. Yeah. And there are people in the world, I think, who can't do that kind of hard. Probably there are probably people in the world who just like can't go without money or can't go without security or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And that's not that's not necessarily bad. But for the most part, you like you said, you said, who what was his name? Isaac Litsky. You're, you're making it way more awful than it is. Yeah. Like, you know, having to eat cheap food for a little while and not being able to go out. That was hard, but not as hard as crying myself to sleep, watching myself and my blood pressure go up and my weight go, because I'm miserable all because of this identity that I, you know, I have to be, I'm a public defender, you know, that's important. And it was important, but I'd gotten wrapped up in it. Yeah. I mean, I could not agree more. I don't want to take up too much of your time, Drew. Thank you so much. This was incredible. Where can people find you and your comedy? Sure. Uh, Wellreadcomedy.com. W e l l r e d. It's a pun. Uh, <laughs> smart rednecks. Well read. Comedy dot com is where the tour is, and that's where you can get sort of a hold of the three of us. I'm at Drew Morg Comedy. That's D r e w m o r g Comedy uh, on Twitter and Instagram. That's just Drew Morgan on Facebook. You can find me all those places and look out for me other places. I will link to all that in the show notes too. If people want to don't like want to write it down, if you just go to the show notes, I'll have links to all of his social media and other places that you can find him. Thank you again. I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. People, if you do go look for me, I appreciate that. Please understand I am very liberal and very (laughs) vulgar. And most people hate one of those things. Like you got to be honest with yourself before you come expecting something from me that I. (laughs) I love it. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram 
and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.